we will go move into the second part of the event uh, where we're looking at the public sector perspective. But again, once more, before our panel discussion, um, I would like to invite on stage, please, um, uh, Thomas Gagajk, uh, who's the Director of Digital Business Solutions for DG Informatics in the European Commission. Welcome, Thomas. Hello. Um, and I will hand Thank over you, you for another opening statement to take us to the second part of the event. Take it away, please, Thomas. Thank you very much for the introduction, Claire. And good afternoon, everybody here on this uh, nice day and on this uh, very interesting event. And normally I like to, to open up with uh, the infamous opening joke, but uh, in times like this, it doesn't really feel appropriate. And it, just let me say at the very beginning, it feels very good to be here amongst the community that is promoting openness and collaboration. And I'm, I'm very glad to be here, particularly today. Earlier, my colleague Piers from DigiConnect explained how, how crucial open technologies are for the digital transformation of, of society, in partic particular to achieve a healthy economy, robustness and autonomy. And I think this next panel is about balancing digital sovereignty and digital transformation. So I look, look very much forward and to hear the great example that will be brought in by uh, colleagues from, from uh, Czechia, Sweden, France, with examples from those uh, countries, but also my, from my colleague from the interoperability unit from our own general director for informatics at the commission, which is working for, uh, with the member states on these topics. And let me just uh, start out when we talk about digital technological sovereignty, what do we mean by that? And I see effectively three crucial ingredients. The first one, yeah, that's vendor lock-in and it goes beyond vendor lock-in. Yes, let's avoid the lock-in. So the dependency on a single supplier. But it's also trying to avoid and I say trying to avoid because practically, practically it's not always possible, but to keep clear of IT markets, which are at best an oligopole or even an IT monopoly. Um, Piers also referred to those uh, winner takes it all situations that we have in some markets. That already, however, if we can achieve this, these things, that brings us a bit forward. Second, most important aspect is is about availability availability of partners in shall i say nice environments being able to work with companies and experts based in europe if you wish to do so or with partners in whatever a good word here is reliable countries so it's about having a choice of partners and we have actually unfortunately over the last years we, we have come across a couple of examples where, which show that the impact of not being able to choose can be dramatic. If you look into the uh, epidemic, or the pandemic actually it is, uh, we've seen how interdependent the world is and what impact the lack of choice of partners have has on our supply chains. So uh, we are, we are there in, in, a, in a, a quite dramatic situation here and there. Um, the other example, as, as, you, as you probably expect from the events of the past few weeks, they made it really abundantly clear how fragile is the peaceful balance between liberal and illiberal nations, between the Democrats and the autocrats, and between the free and um, less free, not, not free. And we, we need to be very, very mindful who we want to depend on. So, however, let me also be clear, being able to work with companies and experts live and work in Europe, having that choice, it's not about self-sufficiency. It's about being able to act independently to safeguard and promote our own interests and even more our values and not be at the mercy of a potentially malevolent partner and pursue his 
own interests at eventually our expense. That's what it's really all about. And that's why the third component of technological and digital sovereignty is, in my view, the most important one. It's access. It's access to technology and standards. And therefore, there is really only one way to guarantee this type of access, and that is by being open. Actually, uh, Sivon said something very interesting in, in the, in the uh, opening statement. More openness leads to more control, which sounds counterintuitive, but that's exactly the, the, exactly the case. Let me talk about the open source at the European Commission. Our primary tool for the access is open source software. And actually, I think that might have uh, brought me the, this opportunity to talk to you today uh, as a representative of DG Digit. Because we at the European, in the IT of the European Commission, we have, we're showing great progress. And I'm really proud of what we've achieved over the last two years in particular. You will find open source software all over the Commission. A couple of examples. All our Commission websites use Drupal. Our internal software development environment relies on open source. Our data center runs to more than 75%. And actually, that percentage is growing. Linux. And even more, on top of using open source software, we are increasingly sharing our software as open source with the outside world. And the biggest example there include the software intended for use between the Commission and the member states. A big chunk of the open source software that has been built was under the Connecting Europe facility, which is driven by our interoperability unit and Max Strottmann. My colleague uh, from that unit will actually represent Digit in the upcoming panel, and he can tell you whatever you want to know about this. But on top of that, there are more than 150 other software solutions shared by um, my general director at Digit, by Eurostat, the Joint Research Center, DG Mare, DG, the general directorate for the employment, and many others. And I cannot talk, about, cannot talk about open source at the Commission without mentioning my favorite project, which is LEOS, the legislative uh, writing tool, the legal text edit editor, that we as a Commission are now actively co-developing as open source solution together with developers from the governments in Germany and Spain. Soon others, such as Greece, are going to join that. LEOS has a huge potential to transform the process to create legislation to a much more efficient way, therefore leading to a more consistency across different policies, and last but not least, provide an unprecedented levels of transparency. And all these are very important elements to sustain and to build public trust in government and our policy making. And uh, I don't think I need to uh, explain why this is more important than ever. So here is an opportunity for the digital transformation to really transform the way that we have done things traditionally to a totally different level of uh, value. Let me use that example to refer to hot of the press, the ministerial declaration that was following last week's uh, UPAN meeting. The UPAN is the network of European public administrations. That ministerial declaration confirmed the important role of open source software solutions in the transformation of public administrations, and that open source enables those administrations to pool their efforts and resources to collaborate, and all the, the things you see coming to play and coming to life in the LEOS project, among many, many others. Let me give you one more example, because it kind of like sticks out and may be relevant uh, for, for some of you here in the audience. Our uh, General Directorate for uh, Maritime Affairs and Fisheries, DJ Mare, has developed the contract as an open source tool, the commitment tracker, which is targeting at organizers of series of conference, like annual meetings of policymakers, researchers, things like that. 
and it offers a way to effectively and efficiently track, keep track on commitments, considerations, milestones, assurances, and all these type of things that you that you need to keep an eye upon when you're running a series of conferences. So you see, we have a 20 year, 20 year plus, I think it's fair to say by now, progressive experience and appreciation of open source at the European Commission. And like everybody else, we started you by using, just using, consuming open source software. But then we went on to actually build our own solutions based on open source building blocks. And in 2007, this led to the creation of the EUPL, the European Union Public License, which allowed us then to share based on our own values, laws, and rules of first open source solutions. Other commission services followed, most notably the Joint Research Center, which had been supporting open source software right from the start. Eurostat, for instance, shared its first open source solution in 2011. And today, open source is nothing short of being mission critical for the European Commission. We use open source wherever IT solutions are put in place to help achieve the Commission's political goals. So at Digit in 2020, we took our open source strategy, revamped it, and elevated it to Commission-wide strategy. With this, we went from goodwill to a structural approach towards open source. And with that strategy, we created, as part of this strategy, we created the OSPO, our open source program office, which helps the whole commission to really leverage the strategic value of open source and really confirmed and made that strategic value absolutely clear. One of the first things we did with the open source program office is to make it easier for us to share software as open source. And in that process, also to include a security check. And those household rules had been announced only last December, and we're very proud of having reduced and eliminated that red tape in the process. And that allows us to actively encourage our own software development teams to start new projects with sharing and reuse in mind. And we're also challenging ourselves to review our existing and legacy projects for sharing and, and uh, publishing those, making those available to the outside world, wherever it makes sense. And very soon, we will launch our own external repository to allow easy public access to, uh, to, to the open source software that we are publishing. And therefore, we will concentrate our work going forward uh, even more on the open source side of things. Um, security, Piers mentioned security. Open source, cybersecurity, they are intrinsic, intrinsically linked. And our OSPO team has experience in organizing bug bounties, hackathons. Most of you will be very aware of this. And cybersecurity, as you can imagine, again, from events of the last weeks, cybersecurity is on our open mind 24 7. Precisely, last year we organized two hackathons, one on uh, Jitsi, one on the Connecting Europe facility component, e-delivery. We organized bug bounties, four of them, Moodle, Zimbra, Metrics, Element, and LibreOffice, and there are more coming. So this is something that we put into our, shall I say, daily open life, uh, to our open source lifestyle that we uh, keep um, animating the, the, the community by offering these type of events. And thanks to the OSPO, we can now help our other commission services, our other general directorates to use the same methods and to use uh, effective proven methods to safeguard the security of our open source software. 
But the Commission is only one player and we will need to join forces with the member states to better protect against malicious computer users and protect our infrastructure from threat. We all have to guard ourselves against unfortunate incidents. We had Block4j, I think, all fresh in our memory and against other security issues, whatever surprises they might come. And thanks to the OSPO and also thanks to the financial support we uh, are enjoying from the European Parliament, when it comes to open source security, we will work with our peers in the member states to find and assist critical projects increasing their sustainability and security. And of course, not just for ourselves, it's open, it's for all of us. So there are a lot of actions with which the Commission helps uh, others in their open source journey and also where the Commission takes others along on its maturity to become a viable value added member of the open source community. And I hope I've made that abundantly clear that it's the most practical way to achieve technological sovereignty because this the sovereignty is the outcome of openness. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you for sharing your journey with us. And, and I just want to again say thank you to the Open Forum Europe for giving us the opportunity to hear that journey, because sometimes I think in, in these instances, it's as important to be able to have a community to come together to hear those stories. I loved your examples as well. Definitely need to have a look at the uh, commitment tracking thing from the mar maritime uh, group. So thank you for that. And um, there was one quick question in the chat that came through as you were speaking, and I will take this opportunity to, to ask um, because it does relate back to Sivan's uh, earlier comments. And it's it's about how much um, of your source code that you is developed there at DG or, or is it reused from other open source projects? So that's just a question on the reuse versus build yourself. Jesus, that's a very, very good question. Um, <laughs> frankly, we're not counting that. Uh, I can only say that we use a lot of open source frameworks. We use uh, Angular, for instance, um, many, many others. We, we, we use uh, Kafka as, as an open source solution for our event streaming. Um, and uh, how, how that actually uh, is uh, uh, split, I, I can't tell you. And, and I wouldn't really know how to measure it as well. The key thing is for us really that what we are adding and what we are producing is becoming available for the public benefit. And one example, we were in need, uh, was it two years ago or something, for a functionality in Drupal that would allow us our hundreds of websites to uh, quickly and more, more efficiently upgrade them to, to whatever uh, the latest version was at the time. And we paid uh, for an external team actually to contribute that feature to the Drupal stack so to have it available as open source to the whole community using Drupal. And, and it's something obviously that we did for ourselves as well at the same point in time. So this is how we like to go about it, that what we do has a value beyond our immediate need and, and will help not just us, but will help the wider, the wider public and the user community. A fantastic approach. Thank you so much, Thomas. Um, and thank you for sharing your viewpoints with us now. Um, at this point now, I would love to invite on stage the next set of panelists, which will be our final discussion before the end of the event. So welcome. And as you come on, please do wave and say hello. But welcome to Teresa Gagnon, who's head of partnerships at Sesco Dig Digital, to Bastien Guri, who's the free software officer for free, from, from the free software unit Etalab in France. Johan Lineker, from the Senior Researcher in RISE Research Institutes of Sweden, and Max Strutman, who's the Deputy Head of the Interoperability Unit uh, from the European Commission. So welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Um, I know you've probably been listening to all the great uh, input so far, but now we're going to get this perspective from, from all of you, from the public sector perspective. And I will start with you, Bastian. Um, you're based in France. Would you like to describe, I mean, there was a lot of discussion earlier about the um, impact for citizens, building trust with citizens. Citizens. Um, and also, you know, how how we're, how citizens are being impacted by this whole digital transformation. So would you like to maybe comment about how that is happening in France in the context of open technology? Hi, everyone. Uh, thank, uh, thank you for having me. And uh, it's really glad to listen to all the 
uh, <coughs> all the people talking about uh, open source here. Um, if I can quickly first describe the progresses that we've made uh, recently, um, that would help understand how citizens are in this picture. First, we made a progress uh, by strengthening collaboration within ministries in France. So we have more uh, experts of free software discussing with each other, recommending uh, free software for all the administration. Second, we have made progress on publishing source code from the administration. We have more than 9,000 uh, repositories and, and counting. Uh, we made progress on contributing to the existing um, free software ecosystem. So we are now tracking every contribution that um, civil servants uh, from the French administration is doing to other existing uh, free software out there, some by private companies, some by uh, communities, uh, whatsoever. And we made also some legal progress by making, making it clear for every uh, buyers from the administration how to uh, get the, the intellectual property on the source code they are uh, buying and paying for, so that helps publishing this source code uh, afterwards. And finally, but most importantly, we made uh, institutional progress by having an action plan um, by the government for free software and digital commons in general, and by um, spreading this idea that ministries have to organize themselves, having their own OSPOs uh, to deal with all these issues, because the, the, the administration I'm part of is not aware of all the issues that uh, the ministries know about. So we have the Ministry of Education, for example, um, having uh, people in charge of everything related to uh, free software and the Ministry of Research uh, relying on the Committee for Open Science, uh, which integrated the dimension of software just last year. And that's quite new because open science used to mean open access of research, open data, and now it, it also encompasses um, source code. That, so that's a huge step forward for European research, and we hope that uh, uh, it, it, it will show in a few, year, in few years. So that said, um, these efforts for more uh, free software in the administration uh, somehow happens to the citizens without them uh, to know because it enhances the quality of the public services, the mutualization so uh, of, of uh, solutions, and uh, the reversibility and so the independence of uh, uh, administrations. So citizens don't notice that because that's internal stuff, but that's very important. So it also happens with the citizens in the sense that <clears throat> we have the open government partnership France is part of this uh, initiative, and within this framework, every administration has been proposing some very specific actions, and some of these actions are about uh, promoting free software. For example, we recently had our administration in charge of data protection, uh, organizing an event just last week, discussing with the association of uh, software freedom uh, promoting software freedom for the citizens. So having this dialogue with the, the ecosystem is very important. We also uh, set up a free software council uh, that is um, set up by the free software unit. And this council uh, regrouped both administrations and representatives from the ecosystem, from the Mozilla Foundation, from the Eclipse Foundation, from OW2, from uh, companies and having this platform to discuss with each other is key in having this collaboration. And finally, uh, citizens are welcome to contribute to this global effort from the French administration thanks to the Blue Hats movement that is open to citizens. So, for example, we have an open mailing list where we discuss with everyone. That's quite uh, open, I would say, in the very uh, same spirit for the early free software projects. We have this Blue Hat Semester of Code program where we try to attract young uh, engineers and students to contribute not to software that the administration is developing, but to software, to free software that the administration is using. So in the overall, I really have this feeling that this is a turning point where we take software citizens' freedom seriously and we try to align it with the key values of the 
uh, public administration. Thank you so much, Bastian, and thank you for outlining that in such detail as well. It's it's almost like a framework that other countries can then follow. So I, I really appreciate that. We'll have to write that down afterwards. Um, but, and I'm sure you already have, so we'll, we'll connect right to that. It'd uh, be lovely to see that repeated in, in, in Ireland anyway. Uh, but thank, thank you for that. Um, so, Max, I'm going to come to you next. Um, uh, we, we already heard from your colleague in, in the European Commission, but um, when we think about I suppose, where we're at right now. We, we've heard about the great progress that the European Commission has made. But if we would take a step back for a minute and then look at the overall situation with where we're at with digital autonomy and, and removing dependencies, where are we at now? How far along the journey are we? Considering all the great progress has been made, how much how much further do we have to go? Uh, wh where? What's your point, point of view on that? Claire, thank you, thank you for your for your question, and uh, happy to see you all. And I, I don't see the audience, but I, I I'm happy to be with you with you today. And I would love to to uh, take my uh, blue hat off uh, for Bastien, but I well, I knew he would have one. I knew, <laughs> and one day I get one. <laughs> okay, state of autonomy. My autonomy without blue hat is not as good. State of autonomy. I'd say in a way we are working on it which is not, well, it is reassuring, but not entirely, uh, completely reassuring. Uh, and uh, I think a lot of this uh, has been discussed also in the in the first part of, uh, of this co conference with the first panel. Uh, and there is a lot of happening, thankfully, thanks to, to Piers and his friends uh, uh, and our friends in, in DG Connect, and not least also because of the work that you are doing, uh, Ofi and, and all the, the colleagues around here. Uh, but I would like to pick up something on this topic, what um, earlier Vittorio said. It is very nice looking for and feeding unicorns. That's all very good. And I love it because I come out of the startups uh, support uh, movement. Um, but I would, I cannot enough stress, and I think this has come up earlier also here today, the importance of the public sector in this digital transformation journey that that europe is going through and you call it strategic autonomy or strategic open strategic sovereignty whatever you call it in all this voyage um the public sector is extremely important i think mike said it uh, i noted it on um earlier and because it is about fair inclusive accountable values-based open digital transformation lots of stuff but lots of stuff that we want in there and the interesting thing is that we have it now we public sector uh bastien other colleagues around the table we have it in our hands collectively but we will not be able to do it alone the public administration uh, administrations without the community uh the public sector uh, the private sector that is around and just as a sheer weight of the public sector, I think if we digitalize in this fair, inclusive, open, et cetera, way, the public sector, this means it's 50% of GDP or even more in some countries. I, we counted with our colleagues, it's more than 40 billion euros that go only in the public sector digital transformation from the Recovery and Resilience Fund, collectively, all the member states, that's massive. If we can do this open, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, uh, we have a different approach and we get to the strategic open um, uh, sovereignty. Uh, because this transformation, and, and I am, my colleagues, we are deep, deeply convinced this does not work without openness, without cooperation, without uh, what Sivan said, uh, open tech. Uh, in the public sector, uh, all this open tech is, is nothing new, but we see it clearly emerging now, uh, uh, stronger, more recognition like ever before as a strategic instrument. Uh, okay, I have somebody coming through with a um, cleaning here, which is very nice. Um, and uh, um, this, uh, Thomas referred to the Strasbourg Declaration, where I'm sure that Bastien was heavily behind. And we had the Berlin Declaration before that was stressing the same issue. So it's nothing new. And the idea that I see is to ensure the degree of control of our own fate, which is the core of public sovereignty. And the second aspect that is overlooked, but I think it was part of the Berlin Declaration very clearly, is the cooperative element according to our own values and supporting the local needs that we have across Europe, which is in a way powering subsidiarity. So sovereignty and subsidiarity double. The EU is, of course, a value-based uh, community. Not everybody's identical, uh, but we have the same foundations. 
Uh, and this for me is, is already in itself speaking to a community, an open source community. It can be difficult, all these long council sessions, but it leads us to something that is a common uh, uh, foundation. We need to be patient, but this cooperation pays off. And we are also not alone in that in the world. And that's what I would like to take up, something that came across also in the further section. This is not about autarky. We are not about cutting off from the world. We want to keep the doors open. Um, because that's the very nature of open technology. So we are clearly interested in linking with our partners. And I would just want to say personally, and I think I speak for the colleagues in the, across the institution, a clear and loud uh, yes to international uh, cooperation. Um, and, and if you allow me just a, a minute on what exactly is the next step, because that's what you said. Where do, does it lead us? Where do we go? Um, Okay, in our work on public sector interoperability, there is a very long tradition on open source in the Connecting Europe facility, the ISA solutions, and all of some of you may know it. Uh, the, Thomas also just now uh, referred to it, what the Commission itself is doing. And we want now to go to the next level. We're working actually as we speak on a regulation on interoperability, on European public sector interoperability that uh, should create a structured cooperation framework uh, in uh, across the EU on interoperability. We don't want any more red tape, that's very clear. Uh, so rather something like blue tape, uh, if you allow me the, the energy here, or green tape, I mean, blue tape is nicer. It's the sky and forward. Um, and for this, and I'm very happy also that we have a colleague from uh, uh, Czech Republic here. We got a lot of support from the French presidency and the incoming uh, Czech presidency, and also then the incoming Swedish presidencies. The idea is clearly to create a core role to bind in the central member state digital transformation offices, CIOs of the state, in a guiding role for interoperability across Europe, in a cooperative role. And a second element, a broad community of experts, practitioners, uh, academic experts, private sector experts, uh, civil society, very important, to sustain this cooperation and to push it forward. Sort of a permanent co-creation process around interoperability, open interoperable uh, tools for the public sector across Europe and the world, if the world wants to join in. So openness, open source, a persistent strand. I agree also with Sivan and Thomas, uh, more openness means more joint control. And so for what we propose, it's not yet law, huh? we propose to have a share and reuse obligation on public sector solutions as default in that. Of course, not mandating, we can't do that open source, but we want to push it, to nudge it as much as we can. We want to collect and to open the door towards existing reusable open solutions at all levels in, in Europe. Uh, and not least see this as an important procurement support tool for, for example, local administrations. And this procurement aspect, you, Claire, and other colleagues brought it up, how important it is for, for SMEs and startups. We want to have strategic areas for policy areas where we support them so that we don't reinvent the wheel across education, environment, agriculture, and so on. Let's reuse things wherever we can. We want to work with the GovTech and the civic tech sectors, public, private. We have a dedicated GovTech call uh, going now, and we want more of that structurally. And of course, we need clear link to the ongoing data policy work of the colleagues in DG Connect within the commission, the Data Governance Act, the Data Act, the Data Spaces, and so on, but also to the multi-stakeholder platform on ICT standardization, structural linked to this rock. And as a final point, maybe here on what we would like, as I say, these are all ideas. The Commission has not yet decided to put this forward, but we push uh, and we have a lot of support for it. A final point, also something that was mentioned, OSPO cooperation. With that regulation, we would like to lay the ground, the organizational ground for structural OSPO cooperation across public sector bodies in, in the EU, not telling everybody to do the same thing, but learning from each other, cooperating, speaking to each other. Uh, you said it, uh, Deborah, and others said it. I switch off, I stop here. Interoperability, uh, uh, next steps in the policy, hopefully we get through. For me, interoperability rhymes with cooperability, and I think this is the shared story here. I shut up.
No, thank you, Max. That's brilliant. I mean, that, that was a vision into the future in terms of what's coming down the line. It's fantastic. And what's going to stay with me, I think, forever is the idea of getting rid of red, red tape and creating a blue tape that binds us together for a better future, which I love. Right. That's 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 fantastic. So uh, thank you very much for sharing that. Um, Johan, we're going to come to you next in the, in, in the in the context of research. Um, based on what you have seen in the research community, how have you seen this uh, trend towards open technology be represented there? And, and what kind of impact is that trend, if it's increasing, let's hope it is, what kind of impact is that having on, on the citizens' lives in terms of translation of research? So, <clears throat> thanks. Um, so, I think that research is advancing. Uh, it's research in, in open source has mainly been focused on the on practice which we can find in in the private sector and, and uh, inside the, the communities and I think um, research has a has a key role here to play in uh, advancing the, the state of knowledge but also in um, in uh, in uh, enabling the public sector to to use and leverage open source be it to achieve digital autonomy or uh, increase cost efficiency or whatever the goal is. Um, and I think one important role here is to um, to to study uh, and uh, compare and report on best practice, like the like the great work Bastin is doing, uh, and the work that we can find in Italy, um, like we're, with Developers Italia, with the uh, municipal collaboration in Denmark. There was two collaboration. We have lots of great uh, great initiatives that we can that we can study, and and report on and uh, help provide feedback into the, the into the public administrations and public sector and also study how OSPOs actually are working within the private sector and how that could translate into a public sector context. Um, but we, we also have a, an important role here to play in studying like specific areas like we, we talked about cybersecurity uh, you know, briefly and I think security and sustainability in, in open source projects is a very important area because as, as we know that open source is everywhere and supply chain attacks are increasing. So we have to find, okay, what, what role does the government have to play here uh, in this co-creation and um, compared to, to, to the private actors, to civil society, to academia and, and to us, the citizens in this co-creation. So we have great, much great work here being done by researchers such as Bogdan Valiscu, Igor Steinmacher, Anita Sarma, Matt German pre to mention we have collaborations such as the Open Source Security uh, Foundation, the Chaos Community, Sustaining Open Source Community. Um, and so we have all of these collaborations, but we have to get the public sector to, to come in here as well, because right now it's mostly private sector, civil society and, and the communities and us, the users and developers who are engaged. We need to get the public sector in here as well. Um, and uh, another another area I, I'd like to highlight is the procurement acquisition. We talk a lot about the hindrance and challenges implied by how, how public administrations need to procure. Public administrations, especially on municipal and regional levels, they don't have the technology resources that's as com private companies do, uh, they need to procure these resources and we need to find ways in how how we can use existing frameworks because I don't think necessarily it's anything wrong or broken with our current frameworks. There are different variants that we are exploring like the dynamic purchasing systems that could and they ideally enable an agile and open procurement of, of, uh, of technology. So. How can administrations collaborate on the acquisition maintenance of open source projects such as the OS2? How can uh, national, how can we from a central location like Bastion is doing, help and nurture and build a culture within public sector generally? Um, how can we uh, formulate tenders so we don't end up in, in lock-ins and unnecessary dependencies? So. These are all areas where I think research can go hand in hand with public sector and, and, uh, and help. But I, I just like to also highlight the general problem here that uh, much of the knowledge that is created uh, and both within practice and research, it doesn't reach practitioners within the public administrations or they are not receptible to it. There is no absorptive capacity to actually suck it in. 
Um, and yeah, there's there's a lack of culture, there's lack of knowledge, there's lack of resources. I mean, and again, especially on on uh, on the municipal and regional levels, where a municipality in Sweden of five five thousand people have the same responsibility and the need to to deliver as one, as uh, a, a, a municipality of one one uh, hundred or a, a million individuals. So you can't expect that these small ones to have the same capacity. Um, so we, we need to find ways in how to how to build the culture and build the absorptive capacity and, and may get the public administration more receptive to research and practice from from industry and the, the, the communities. Um, there are different ways, like the, this OSPO network, I think, is one one key way in how we can collaborate across these different tech uh, tech pools uh, and, and and have a joint conversation and knowledge sharing. Um, in research calls, mandating collaborations as part of the research project, or even as we're we're, we're working on, on as an example in, in with Rice, we're working on a on a research and development project in an open source setting, engaging both with entrepreneurs and and uh, and um, public sector administrations directly through the open source project. So not with this funding agency uh, as a proxy so we're doing it in, in an open way i think we can learn much of how this new way of collabor collaborating so, yeah. no that's that's fantastic and and before we move on can i just ask because it, it piqued my interest there when you were talking about the examples of shared procurement across various different government bodies i mean are there examples of that in action today because because again this is exactly the kind of thing that that i think many people are, are looking at but there are examples are there so i'm seeing okay. max nodding there um examples of, of folks that actually have collaborated with multi-agency or multi-department uh, procurement and maintenance um plans are they they in existence? Yes, they are. There, there's uh, like I mentioned, there's one example in in Denmark, the OS2 collaboration, OS2.eu. We have okay. about sixty or seventy municipalities uh, that come together with, like, they, they could spin up a project based on one or two municipalities, and then they, it may grow, and then they put together a technical council, and then they procure the development by this ecosystem of, of different vendors. So functioning much like uh, like an open source foundation yeah. and we you can find um, examples in, in belgium and uh, and holland and also in sweden on this fantastic so there are there are examples to, to learn that, that definitely sounds like a pattern we need repeated um, abroad so yeah completely hear you on the on the challenge to actually get that knowledge out from folks that are in the ecosystem to to the broader set of folks that might be able to benefit from it so thank you johan for that and i'll move now to Teresa. Um, in the context of, of civil society and, and, and your experience in terms of working to make an impact from a civil perspective. So how do you think civil society can get involved? Because we've heard from Bastian at the Blue Hats, love that, by the way. But but apart, like, apart from that, in, in a broader sense, how can civil society get involved in fostering the use of open technologies as a way to actually transform our entire EU society? Thank you, Claire, and uh, thank you for having me today here. Um, I'm happy that uh, I can represent a civic tech organization on this event because we are kind of playing the role to bridge all these, uh, uh, all this ecosystem that you just mentioned. And I'm very happy that uh, you mentioned a lot of things that uh, I, I might be repeating again, but uh, our role is a little bit different. We are um, we are representing the organization that, that, that is neutral, that is kind of citizen driven, that is like a community of tech ex experts that are trying to bridge the gap that is uh, basically the technological gap that is uh, in government or public services and uh, non-government NGO sector. Uh, we believe that this, this, these, these players have a super strong impact on society. So that's why we uh, feel that it has a value to uh, give basically like a like a private time, you know, to to um, br bring the expertise to these to these um, um, to these areas, and um, just to just to make uh, make a little uh, background about the network. So so we are basically like a, a camp organization that is uh, typical in any any country in the world is there is a global chain of civic tech organizations and i believe that we 
we all uh, try to work together because there is definitely the technology, there is the layer that can interconnect um, not just um, different different uh, players within the country, but also across the across across the um, basically across the globe. Or uh, that's what we try try for. Um, we do advocate open technologies. We do believe that. Uh, what is custom developed by government should be should be basically open. Uh, we believe that this brings definitely the security part of the of the of the um, of the benefit and also the reusability, as you mentioned, that this should be the big focus on right now. So we do promote it. We do advocate it. We work with other uh, organizations, expert organizations from open open source area, like um, also with the software developers. So we try to bring everyone to the table uh, as we work with the government and uh, nonprofit uh, sector. To, to, to maybe mention a few examples, um, we believe that the change should be really complex. It's, it should not be just driven by the government. It has to be uh, like an open table. So we uh, do organize like open, open discussions about vendor lock-in. We do organize uh hackathons or tender tone we recently did kind of uh, proof of concept of uh, uh kind of government contracting uh, template for the municipalities or for public institutions because there are a lot of uh, barriers and um fears also so we try to bring the bring the helping hand with the with the help of technology experts to to bring everyone to the table and the surprising moment on that tender tone was that uh, actually even the commercial sector even the players who are um trying to solve the vendor lock-in thing they they started to understand the government uh, officers the fears that they have you know and they, they they now can better communicate there is a lot of a lot of barriers in communication so we believe that uh, we need to do it, do the transformation in a complex way. So it is about education, about open open panels, about bringing also methodologies from abroad. Uh, we are bringing, um, uh, for example, like a manual or best practice um, about running um, government, a large government IT project, like the risking them or being able to drive them in an agile way. So. This is something that we step by step work on, try to connect all the players. And that's uh, that's what we believe in that will be the way how to how to do the change. Uh, another example that we went through was uh, in the in the COVID pandemic time, you know, there was the big effort um, around uh, bringing new technologies that will help to uh, solve the chaotic situation. And we were building with the government COVID portal, uh, the same initiative happened in the UK, for example. And again, we used the open technologies. So for the government, it was an, a very nice example to try it, to try it to um, like publish, publish it as a government open source code. So we, this is like a first first steps how to how to deliver uh, deliver software that is public but licensed licensed as open source. Um, this this was definitely like a nice moment because this whole situation that was chaotic uh, required to uh, support or um, help the government to bring trust and you know building these tools also like COVID tracing apps it, it is about trust there is not more uh, no, no more imp not more important thing than than this so we we believe that doing it in with open technologies in a transparent way collaboratively is the way how to do how to do it uh so with these examples i i would just uh, i would just uh, summarize that uh, what we believe in is that, that is that um, using open technologies needs um, strong product owner on the government side mm -hmm. uh collaboration and also um, empowered or enab digitally enabled citizens. So this is another element that we are trying to, to build and help with. 
Well, thank you, Teresa. And I think it's a fantastic example of, of like how you can give citizens agency over their own future. Like sometimes when you hear about everything around digital transformation, it always feels like it's being done to you. Oh, my God, what am I being transformed into? But the idea that you actually can take a, a meaningful role in that and like like with the Blue Hat group, but also like what, what you're doing to help facilitate that. I mean, that's what's that's what's often is 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 um, is what's necessary so that, that that all that energy, positive energy that can be leveraged, but actually directed in a meaningful way and in a useful way rather than spread out you know spray gunned at, at, at various different efforts and um, it's fantastic work you're doing so congratulations um, and and I'll, I'll just follow up with a question that came through on the chat and it's in the context of everything you talked about the importance of connecting between people between agencies and individuals and one of the points that was made earlier is the role that that an institution like an open source program office could play in that and, and the rise of for example open source program offices in in public sector organizations as well as in corporations um, and it, it was i think following on from from um johan's uh, comment about this idea of 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 people being able to gather together municipalities being able to gather together and i'll note he shared some some resources there that i hope is going to be shared afterwards uh, so we can dig into that in more detail but the question was specifically do we see that is there an, an opportunity for people to actually collaborate on on pool resources to build an OSPO? So, you know, rather than this idea that everyone has to have an OSPO, which again might be a, an outlay that many people don't want to commit to upfront, is there a potential for, for example, municipalities to come together, have a centralized kind of uh, institution that will help them get over those goals that were mentioned earlier? Anyone, anyone want to take that one? I'm seeing nodding. Is, is, is that a, what, what could be done to help that happen then maybe, Johan? There, I, I, there are d different versions. One, one way is municipalities coming together, forming like a, like a, their own found, open source foundation, you, you could call it. And uh, definitely, I mean, if we want municipalities to, to really start adopting open source, this is what, what needs to be to happen. Like in Sweden, we have 290 municipalities ranging from 5,000 to, to 1 million inhabitants. And... Uh, they have they they need to collaborate because a vast majority they don't have the the knowledge and culture and, and so on to to make this happen so we need they need to centralize and there is this real shout out for for centralized initiatives in, in this and this is not limited to open source but uh, talking about the digitalization and digital transformation in, in general so yes there there is need and there is potential for this so creating a common open source fund foundation, quote unquote, could be one way. Uh, going top down, uh, like like uh, from the central national agency, like the public uh, agency for digitalization, uh, and going down to regional levels may be one way. Also, there's the Foundation for Public Code, a uh, Dutch-based uh, nonprofit that, that helps municipalities, like in the case uh, in, in, in Holland. Um, and uh, the open sack and uh, an open source project uh, and more. So civil society can provide this neutral area as well, and also academic and other neutral uh, institutions can can be this can can be this central um, point to help the, the collaboration happen and work as the knowledge sharing and uh, arena for conversations between the vendors and and uh, public sector. So there are different models here that very much are need to, uh, we need, need to see, uh, we need to experiment and learn from which one works best and what, you know, what cases and so on. Brilliant, well, th thank you for that uh, guidelines. Max, would you like to come in on that? Yes, I, I'd love to, because this uh, this is something that for us is, is extremely important. And I think it came out uh, in, in all from all, all four of us in a way. And so it's interesting that the question comes up there also. Just to add, I mean, to completely endorsing uh, what you said and what also Teresa and Bastian said in insisting in the inclusion of civil society in all of that, for which digital tools are perfect in the end, if we make them open. Uh, and, and accountable and accessible. But uh, one element maybe just as for information also to bring in that, the, the colleagues in the commission in, in uh, DG Connect, uh, they have a uh, dedicated unit for smart cities and communities. And they are very actively engaging with quite a number of communities, so cities uh, usually, but also regional authorities across Europe in, in a sort of very bottom-up movement that is called living in EU. But the whole idea is actually sharing expertise about public sector digitalization, what works, what doesn't work, learning from it, pooling, 
setting, trying to define common interoperability mechanisms, what they call minimum inter interoperability mechanisms, um, uh, which, which I find is, is super exciting. So I've been part of some of the discussions there and they ex exactly touch on what all of you have been saying, the link between the civil uh, society and the public administrations. They need to link to my neighboring um, cities or, or departments because it is not only uh, uh, a geographic issue, it is also a sectoral issue from the education department to the environment department to the buildings department uh, and the mobility and, and so on. And this, of course, also cross-border in many parts of Europe. This is essential. Um, so I think this is a very interesting aspect. And we try uh, not to go too far on the interoperability policy, but try to build something that supports also these movements where Europe does not tell anybody what to do, but that I, as a local uh, body, organization, department, can tap in the expertise uh, that is there, uh, ideally through like OSPO type of, or foundations or whatsoever. Thank you. Thank, thanks, thanks for that, Max. And that, that's a great addition. Well, we have about five minutes left, so a very, a very, a very short round ne next. But I just want to ask each one of you, based on everything we've heard today, and thank you for all your contributions just there now. But if you had to choose, like, what are the milestones we should be looking out for, and um, the next set of milestones in terms of progress towards a goal of open strategic digital autonomy, and and everything we have described here in terms of these collaborations, um, a, a shift towards more public goods um, all, and more trustworthy services and citizen engagement. For everything we have described here, what would be a milestone you would look for um, in the coming, say, year or two um, that we would that would show that we're on the right path? Bastian, I'll come to you first. Well, I would mention two milestones. The first one is to see each other because we've been collaborating online for the last two years and uh, lots of things have been done. The next one would be <clears throat> because if we talk about uh, Europe and values from Europe, we, we cannot talk, uh, we have to talk about democracy. And uh, the next milestone for me would be to have a very visible um, project to, uh, to get institutions, public sector, closer to the civic uh, initiatives so that we empower citizens when it comes to the digital transformation that they have to be a part of. And software freedom movements for the last 40 years have been all about this. And the same as individual freedom is a risk and a chance for democracy, uh, you have to bet on individual software freedom to build the larger uh, digital sovereignty of democracies working together. That, that will be the next milestone for me in the next few years. Thank you, Bastian. Teresa, what, what about you? I, I, would, I would just summarize it as a, we heard freedom, which is like resiliency, which goes very closely with security, you know, so I, I feel like open, open source can play a fantastic role here. Uh, what I would also promote is like public private slash citizen partnership so bring, bring, making the bridges to to connect all the parties and start with the with the small steps uh, in in alignment with the with the with the top down strategies thank you teresa max how about you I, I like both uh, the first speakers, uh, Teresa and Bastian, what they said, and I'm not sure I have really a milestone, uh, but something that gives me a lot of hope uh, that I have the feeling out of our discussion, out of this new approach, also through crisis to digital transformation, that we get to a digital public sector, digital transformation based on true co-creation that is not an, an elite project driven by some powers, whether private or public. It is not an elite project, but it is our common course. And stupidly, like in an old uh, term, the res publica is ours. And actually that we sustain this drive of building, giving ourselves the digital tools to do this, uh, to run the res publica. Brilliant, never waste a crisis. Thank you, Max. Uh, Johan, what about you? What's the, what's the milestone you look forward to seeing? Um, I'd like to see um, both on the European and but especially national levels throughout the, the countries that we explicitly identify the, the challenges that we have in terms of open source, adopting and collaborating on open source, really pointing them out and then laying out strategies for how we 
want to uh, address them in terms of what we mentioned collaboration and uh, acquisition of open source, how we can sustain and, and secure them, our common digital infrastructure. Not This is not just on the national, but also the European level, international level. What role does government, uh, can government have to play here? So really pushing that conversation to, to become explicit. Well, they, they sound like a great set of goals. So I, I want to unfortunately wrap up now because um, uh, we've come to time, but this has been an amazing conversation. I think it has only laid a pathway for how we need to have more of them. Um, and I, I would echo uh, Johan's uh, comments about how we need to share our challenges and the potential solutions. It sounds like a lot of people have made great inroads into uh, addressing these challenges. Um, and I look forward to doing that at some point in the future again with you. But without further ado, I would like to say a huge thank you to Bastian, Teresa, Max and Johan. Thank you all for participating in the second panel and thanks to all the audience for listening in and thank you to everyone at Open Forum Europe for giving us this opportunity to have these discussions. It's really appreciated and look forward to more hats or blue hats and blue tape which will bind us all together for a great open future. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Claire. Thank you. Bye -bye. Bye -bye.